Oh, I forgot to. <laughs> I just went live and just totally whiffed. I forgot to put myself in the <laughs> in the actual screen here. Let me uh, let me join the show. Hey, everybody! I'm Eric Trexler. I'm here with Mike Zordos, and this is a smooth start to another episode of Office Hours Live uh, with the Mass Crew. Uh, if you've been listening for a while, you know that uh, I'm here pretty much every week, and then we rotate in the guest, uh, someone to kind of remind me. Uh, when to wake up and start the show. So this week it is the good doctor, Mike Zordos. Uh, We got a lot of stuff to cover in this episode, Mike. And before we get into all that, I want to remind people of a few very important things. First of all, if you're watching the show and you like it, uh, there are many ways that you could support what we're doing here. Uh, Pretty simple ways you can do that. In fact, Uh, number one, you could like the show. Um, If you're watching on YouTube right now live, you can go hit the little thumbs up button. Uh, wherever you get the show, whenever you get the show, like, rate, subscribe, review, all that stuff helps us very much. Uh, number two, you could tell a friend, spread the word uh, every week, Wednesday night, and then later we put it up on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that stuff. Uh, if you love the show, share it and help it grow. Uh, and then in, the other way you could support us is uh, this show is a question and answer based show. So we need some questions. Uh, if you check the description of this episode, You will find a link where you can submit your questions 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and we appreciate good ones particularly. Good questions, always welcome. And then, of course, if you really love what we're doing uh, and you want more content from the Mass team, you can check out the Mass Research Review at massresearchreview.com. All right, Mike, my man, um, in the Mass uh, Research Review, we are predominantly lifters we talk a lot about lifting right uh but in in recent you know probably within the last two or three years we've started kind of expanding our scope a little bit now we're not trying to stun all of the lifters who uh who tune in every month for a new uh new edition of mass we uh we certainly you know lifting is still our bread and butter but we've started kind of expanding out into related topics that are, you know, kind of on the periphery, kind of tangential topics. So we've been doing more, we've always done nutrition, but we're doing more psychology, coaching, behavior change. And one area where we get quite a few questions, um, but but we don't do it a lot in mass, uh, we don't cover it a lot in mass, is endurance training, right? There are a lot of endurance athletes who do subscribe to mass and have questions about how they should specifically be lifting to support their endurance training goals. So to start off the show, I'd like to hear what advice you would give an endurance athlete. Yeah, so for an endurance athlete, if we think about an endurance athlete and lifting weights, so this is a form of concurrent training. Now, when we hear the term concurrent training, uh, a lot of times people freak out. Uh, It has a very negative connotation. We think, oh, wow, concurrent training That means I'm doing this cardio and I'm going to crush my gains, right? I'm going to have this huge attenuation of hypertrophy or I'm going to stunt my muscle growth. I'm going to blunt my strength gains and so forth. And of course, as we know with resistance training, that's a bit overblown. Sure, that can happen, but it's the dosage of aerobic training that you use that actually causes that effect. And you can probably avoid it or work around it for the most part. But what I want to get across here is that Concurrent training doesn't have to have a negative connotation. Runners or endurance athletes, whether it's rowers or cyclists, but endurance athletes of any kind can use lifting weights to specifically improve. I see somebody saying my mic is a little bit low, Strex. I'm going to try and turn that up here and uh, let me know in the chat if it is still. Let me uh, let me try to I can adjust that. Yeah, did you do anything over there? I turned it up just a little bit. Where did you turn it up at? Just here on the volume on my mic. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll mess with it. Okay, and uh, thanks for letting us know. If anybody does hear any other audio issues or you need something adjusted to hear a little bit better, uh, let us know. We want to make sure everybody can get the information. And so concurrent training, I think, for, for endurance athletes doesn't have to have a negative connotation because the way that we can use it is going to determine if it's helpful or harmful to our performance. And so if we think about it in terms of how it can help performance, how it can help endurance athletes, when used appropriately, meaning you're not training like a powerlifter, you're not training like a bodybuilder, you're training explosive movements, you're training things that are more specific to 
the endurance challenge, the lateral movement. It can indeed help quite a bit. And so I want to outline why I think resistance training is going to be beneficial for the endurance athlete. So first and foremost, it can improve performance specifically related to running economy. So when we think about running economy, that has to do with, let's say, for example, energy cost. So the way a lot of times we assess running economy and endurance athletes is we might have buddy somebody run at, let's say, a fixed speed. So 65% of their VO2 max and assess how much energy they expend. Well, when somebody lifts weights, they then tend to uh, expend less energy when they're running at that same speed. And so their muscle stiffness tends to be better. Their muscle stiffness might increase over time. They're a bit more explosive. Their ground contact time is a little bit less. And so meaning in each stride, they can turn over a little bit better with the running. So resistance training does seem to be helpful for running performance and endurance performance in that way. Another reason that concurrent training, in this case, the incorporation of resistance training into aerobic exercise might be beneficial for uh, endurance athletes is the fact that it could increase hemoglobin mass. And I'll be brief on this, but I'll explain why. And this is actually something that I covered in great detail um, in the next issue of mass in the February issue, an article that I just finished writing. And so for resistance training to increase hemoglobin mass, why does that matter? And what is hemoglobin mass? Well, endurance exercise is really predicated. One of the main determinants of performance is oxygen transport to the muscle tissue. And to do that, oxygen, most of it, about 98% of it is transported within iron, which is in hemoglobin in red blood cells. Now, the more hemoglobin somebody has, an endurance athlete has, that's generally going to be better, meaning more red, red blood cell volume. And I'll turn this back to resistance training in a moment. But what's also important is hemoglobin mass, right? Not just the amount of hemoglobin. Because the amount of oxygen that can bind to hemoglobin on the binding sites is dependent upon the mass of the hemoglobin. Resistance training increases lean body mass, and lean body mass is highly associated with hemoglobin mass. So in a roundabout way, resistance training may actually help that iron transport, again, when done appropriately to help improve lean body mass, not necessarily from the perspective of simply getting jacked. And so right off the bat here, we've got these couple things, improving running economy and increasing hemoglobin mass, and then gets to the perspective of, all right, how do we implement it? What is incorporating resistance training appropriately? Because this can be a beneficial thing, what you don't want to do is then say, all right, resistance training is good, and then do too much of a good thing and actually get the negative aspect of concurrent training. So utilizing this maybe two to three days per week, saying, all right, we're going to utilize explosive training, unilateral training, things that are a bit more running specific, nothing that's super damaging, probably lower repetitions uh, and understanding how to incorporate that in. The last component of this uh, is to make sure we're understanding what the endurance athlete's goal is. And so if we're taking a runner, the perspective that I'm coming from here is a, a longer duration endurance athlete. If somebody is running uh, you know, a sprint distance or even a 400 meter or an 800 meter, they're going to have a bit more musculature. But the longer that goal distance goes, they're going to have a bit less musculature. And those sessions are going to be less focused, certainly on hypertrophy, more explosive and so forth. So keep all of that in mind. But I think the main takeaway is that concurrent training in general doesn't have to have a negative connotation. It probably should have a positive connotation. We just need to look at it on how we can increase these goals. And that goes for lifters as well. Bodybuilders use concurrent training all the time to their advantage. Sure, they look at it and say, how do I need to configure it to make sure I'm not impairing my gains? But they could just look at it as a positive and say, hey, I'm using this to help get ready for the stage, to help shed some fat here, just as an endurance athlete can use this to improve running economy, to improve some of that physiology we talked about that's associated with iron transport, just to use that resistance training appropriately. Awesome. Great stuff, Mike. I'm sure all of our avid endurance athletes out there, our runners, our cyclists, our swimmers are going to appreciate that information. 
let's uh, move on to the next one here. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Uh, might as well stay on theme here with cardio related stuff. So Amy asked about heart rate zones for lifting. Um, and you know, is there a certain intensity that you should aim for in terms of your heart rate while you're lifting weights? Got it. So in, in terms of looking at heart rate zones for lifting weights, um, for uh, for heart rate zones for lifting weights, I, I I don't think that I would use heart rate specifically to program your resistance training, right? So I wouldn't say, all right, I want to utilize my resistance training here between 160 and 180 beats per minute. Not like for running, where somebody might say, I want you to run in zone two, and you might be at 130 beats per minute or something like that. For your moderate pace running, you might get up into 160 or something like that. So I wouldn't necessarily do that for resistance training. You certainly can use it as a gauge, as a guide. When when it's been used in some of the research for resistance training, it's just looking at in general for health purposes, is this person's heart rate being elevated a bit? If it is, that's probably going to be a good thing, especially if somebody is typically a couch potato, that sort of thing. And so sure, but for the purposes of most math, readers or most folks that are here on office hours, it's not something that I would aim for in terms of, hey, I want to keep this heart rate zone here. We have other metrics and resistance training that I think are a bit better than that, whether it's session RPE, whether it's discomfort, whether it's um, the feeling scale, whether it's RIR-based RPE after each set, something like that is probably what I would focus on. But the other aspect of heart rate that I would get into here is heart rate variability which I'm not sure is something that we've talked about a lot on office hours before Trex, but it is something we've talked about in the mass research review. And heart rate variability is essentially the time between intervals or the time between heartbeats. And this has been looked at in really for recovery and resistance training to say, all right, um, if somebody has a, a higher, longer heart rate variability, that tends to be a bit better. Um, and what we'll see here in resistance training studies is we'll do a hard bout of resistance training and then look at muscle damage markers in the next few days, maybe soreness, maybe creatine kinase, things like that. And then also look at heart rate variability. And they'll say, okay, well, when heart rate variability comes back to baseline, uh, is that does that correlate with uh, when performance comes back to baseline? Or does that correlate when soreness is decreased? And the answer in most of those studies is it actually doesn't. Um, it doesn't mean that heart rate variability isn't a decent measure of stress and fatigue and then coming back to baseline, but it does mean that it doesn't tend to correlate in those studies with resistance training performance. And when looking at a metric to track recovery, I think it's important that it tracks with performance. There are a couple studies looking at what I'd call heart rate variability guided training for resistance training. There's a lot more of those studies in endurance training, and I actually covered one of the endurance training studies in mass. And I think Dr. Helms covered the first ever HRV guided training and mass for resistance training. And what I mean by that is, let's say you have two groups of training. One is doing this, we're going to train um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday in this training order. And then the other group is going to say, we're going to train only when we are ready. So when we're going to train, heart rate variability is going to be all over the place. Once it finally comes back to baseline, then we're going to train again. And that is essentially a flexible template. And heart rate variability is just the metric used to guide it. It's similar to saying we're going to have these two groups. One's going to train on this fixed time course. The other's going to change. And then what we could do is just use, say, hey, on a scale of zero to 10, the perceived recovery status scale, we feel ready. We're going to train again. That's all HRV is doing. In those studies, um, not a lot has panned out for heart rate variability, um, especially when you break down how some of the methods were, like the one Dr. Helms reviewed in math. So Overall, to answer Amy's question directly, I wouldn't shoot for a heart rate zone. If you're not familiar with some of those other metrics, um, such as session RPE, um, the feeling scale, of course, repetitions in reserve, I would use a lot of those. Velocity, of course, if you have it. Um, and then if you are interested in heart rate for resistance training, look at HRV. Although I do personally think there are better recovery metrics than HRV for resistance training, I don't think that's quite panned out, at least to this point. Yeah, I, I agree. And I would just kind of reiterate. Um, so when it comes to heart rate zones for lifting, I think it's important to uh, acknowledge some misconceptions. So 
when we're doing endurance type exercise, heart rate is a, a really good um, indicator of the intensity of exercise that we're doing, right? So um, we can, you know, say, oh, we're going to do a light day. We'll keep heart rate lower. We're going to do a harder day. We're going to be in, you know, higher heart rate zones. With lifting, that kind of goes out the window. That, that's really, uh, heart rate is not a, an accurate metric of intensity with regards to resistance exercise. And the reason that's important is because, first of all, um, it kind of nudges people away from the idea that they should be aiming for some kind of heart rate zone while they're lifting. There, there's far more important metrics to be focused on when you're lifting. Um, and, and if we're talking about, you know, you should be looking at proximity to failure, you should be looking at your your rest periods, your volume, all these different training variables that are dictating the stimulus and the response you're going to get. Heart rate really should, uh, during the bout, really shouldn't be at top of mind. Uh, so that's the one thing. Heart rate while lifting is not an indicator of intensity. And second of all, another really important point, I know a lot of folks who are like, you know, I was thinking about maybe doing some cardio uh, to improve my general health, but man, when I'm lifting, like my heart rate gets up really high anyway. So um, I guess I don't need to do cardio because I'm getting that same stimulus. And again, that's absolutely not the case. So um, when we're talking about the adaptations of the cardiovascular system to exercise, you know, the, the heart rate uh, response to lifting is very different from the heart rate response to uh, sustained endurance exercise. You know, it's not like we would say, hey, if you know, if you want to make your heart healthy, either do a bunch of cardio or drink a ton of coffee and watch a scary movie, right? Like that'll get your heart rate up, but it's not going to be giving you the health benefits uh, of, of an, an aerobic exercise bout. So uh, heart rate when, when we're lifting I know it's really tempting to kind of associate it with how we think of heart rate during endurance exercise, but uh, that physiological response is very, very distinct. And so uh, it's really important to kind of uh, clear up some of those misconceptions so that people don't get uh, led astray with regards to heart rate. Yep. And just to, to add to that real quick, I, I think it's important to remember why heart rate training kind of has become a thing in aerobic exercise. And you do get specific adaptations with different heart rate zones that are very desirable, all of those adaptations. And one of the other just more practical reasons with that is um, Jacob says audio is looking good. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, one of the other practical reasons with that is in aerobic exercise, you train in general much more frequently than you do with uh, resistance training. So a high level endurance athlete might do 12 sessions a week, 12 training sessions a week. They're going to double most days, two a days, most days. And, um, and in that case, so we understand why. So if you're training in heart rate zone two, again, 130 beats per minute, something like that, that runner might be doing 10, 12, 14, 15, 16 miles that day. But those are, quote, recovery miles, easy miles. I know that sounds like a lot to those that lift, like, oh, how's this person running 12 miles of recovery miles? But they are. So they can get ready then for their next day where they're going to be doing more some moderate running about 155, 160 beats per minute, something like that. And resistance training, you know, that's just going to be an acute metric of this getting up. Your heart rate's going to be high um, no matter what once once you get into that gym. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I got a quick one I want to address here. Um from Daniel. So Daniel, um, the reason it jumped out to me, the all caps hashtag Trex cult, that's always going to get my attention in the, uh, question submission portal. So this is a good question, uh, from Daniel. Uh, Daniel has been taking glycine twice a day. Um, and, and I think the reason Daniel's taking glycine is I've mentioned in some previous stuff within the mass research review that a lot of folks take collagen, um, supplements because they're trying to, um, you know, experience some benefits related to increasing collagen synthesis in their connective tissues, right? So tendon and ligament stuff. A lot of people uh, use collagen for that purpose. And in some mass articles, I've mentioned that I, I think really glycine, if, if, if that supplementation strategy, strategy is doing much at all, it's probably from the glycine that is in the collagen um, supplement rather than, you know, you probably don't need to take collagen itself. It's really just the glycine in that collagen that's probably doing most of the work. And the reason that matters is because um, there, there's a higher risk of kidney stones if you're taking collagen, really high doses, and if you're predisposed. There's plenty of folks who take plenty of collagen 
never have issues with kidney stones. Um, but it is, uh, you know, there are some things in collagen that theoretically could increase the uh, frequency or prevalence of kidney stones in people who are predisposed. So uh, glycine, you know, could be advantageous. And, and I think a lot of times it just tastes better and is easier to consume as a supplement relative to collagen. Uh, so anyway, the question here is, could glycine be causing some bloating in muscles the same way that creatine does? Um, I'll be honest, I didn't dig into the, the literature on glycine supplementation and look for tiny changes in, um, you know, body mass or, or different uh, indices of intramuscular hydration status. But I will say this, uh, glycine uh, is a component of creatine and it's also a component of betaine. And both of those supplements uh, are known to uh, to cause you know that that kind of uh, effect where they're osmotic, they get stored in the muscle, they increase uh, the volume of the muscle to, to a modest extent. Uh, so all of that is to say uh, it very well could uh, that that one might not be all in your head, um, especially if you know you're naturally you know don't have a lot of betaine in your muscles and you know kind of lower uh, in terms of your kind of baseline muscle creatine saturation it's totally plausible to expect that you might have have that type of effect. Uh, also, it would kind of depend on the glycine dose. But uh, but yeah, not not the craziest thing I've heard by any means uh, could very well be occurring. Um, Mike, in the outline, is there... Oh, there's one other one I want to get to. I know you've been uh, doing a lot of talking here as I've been uh, rapidly trying to rectify our audio situation. There is a question by Jordan here about uh, the spinal erectors, the lower back musculature. And uh, this is an interesting one because my answer is not going to be based on science. It's totally from the gut. Um, But I've been lifting since I was 12. I think I know a thing or two about what people prioritize in the gym and why. So Jordan's question is, um, given how much well-developed erectors can add to the look of one's back, is there a reason that people don't do a lot of dynamic erector training and instead people usually rely on kind of indirect training to build up their their erectors and their lower back musculature? Now, I'm not going to claim to be right about this, but I have a hunch. Uh, well, I have a few hunches. Um, so first of all, I think a lot of people just don't really care that much about how their spinal erectors look. Um, now, a high-level bodybuilder indeed might care. But I think most folks just don't really care enough to do a lot of focused training, hypertrophy training for their spinal erectors. Um, I think a lot of people who are more strength focused say, hey, I'm doing so much squatting and deadlifting and, you know, barbell rowing. My spinal erectors can barely keep up with my training program as it is. You know, I'm, I'm already giving them all they can handle. So I don't really want to add additional direct training to my program because you know, theoretically, it might delay my recovery, or it could be a practical uh, kind of logistical problem where they say, well, if I'm going to do like actual hard spinal erector training, where the heck am I going to put that in my training week? You know, because I, it's not going to be the day before barbell rows, and it's also not going to be the day before deadlifts, and it's also probably not going to be the day before squats. Um, so, so it can be kind of difficult to if you're going to make it really like challenging, rigorous lower back training, it can be kind of difficult to figure out exactly where you want to slot it in. It's not like it can't be done. It can totally be done. But I think a lot of people reach a little bit of friction with that decision-making process and say, eh, forget it. I think I'm fine without it. The third hunch I have is that, um, I mean, every time a human being, forget about lifting in the gym, every time a human being picks up something remotely heavy, three people around them will say, hey, make sure you don't hurt your back picking that up, right? Like we we are so conditioned to be hyper cautious about, you know, really babying our lower backs, uh, treating them like they're made out of the most delicate glass you could imagine. And so for that reason, I think a lot of people say, hey, I don't have any lower back problems right now. I'm very thankful for that. I'm not going to push my luck. I'm only going to tax my lower back to the extent that I absolutely must in order to do the training that I like. Um, I don't support that perspective, um, but I, I think it's prevalent. So if the question is, why do we not see people training their lower back directly that much? I think those are kind of the 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 hunches that come to mind for me. Uh, I don't have a lot of, I don't have any research to back that up, but that that's what I'm thinking. Uh, Mike, 
Do you think any of those are more or less plausible? Do you have any others you want to add to the mix? Um, no, I, I, I do agree with all of that. I think on the, the lower back issue one, you know, uh, you're still getting some of that training, you know, through deadlifting and through some of these other things that you're doing, right? So I wouldn't discount the benefit that, that deadlifts specifically are going to get for that. The other thing is, you know, I'd say in general, um, as you alluded to trucks, you know, we kind of think our lower backs are so fragile and so forth. And as somebody that has had chronic lower back issues, um, you know, I would say that it's not, I, I agree with that very, very much. And I think what people need to keep in mind, and it's something that really just registered with me a few years back was that it's not that your lower back can't handle things. It's that when you do pick something up, you should brace appropriately. If you're bending down to get stuff out of the washing machine or out of the dryer, and which I do quite regularly from taking the kid to swim practice and soccer practice and all of these things, and if you have kids, you understand how often you do the laundry, um, I still make sure that I'm bracing appropriately, even if it's picking up clothes. Um, and when I do that, I tend to not have uh, those issues pop up. So it's not that our backs can handle, especially from compression. Right, your spine can handle a lot of compression. It's the contortion um, and the twisting that that seems to become an issue. At least in my conversations with uh, some of the physical therapists that I've seen that treated me some years ago, and so forth. So I agree wholeheartedly, and I also wouldn't discount the um, training that you might get from some of the other movements like deadlifts for your lower back. Yeah, good call, uh, Mike. There's another one in here that uh, is near and dear to my heart. Um, we got a question from Sengi. And the question is, uh, assuming a lifter starts off fairly lean, how much truth is there to the claim that a natural lifter needs to get to the point of being, quote unquote, fat jacked by the end of a massing phase before trying to cut? Are gains being significantly hindered by ending a massing phase or a bulking phase around 20% body fat rather than pushing closer to 30% body fat? Um, so this is really fascinating because, um, We've, we've done that thing in fitness now. It sounds like people are making this claim. I think we're doing that thing where we had an idea and the evidence didn't support the idea. And then we go for the opposite. You know, the pendulum swings all the way to the other extreme. Uh, and still, I, I don't think we're going to find evidence to support the opposite extreme. So what I'm getting at here and saying that that's not, uh, I, I, that's not, uh, a, a jab at you by any means. Clearly, people are are saying this out there. It, it's a claim that's being made, um, and so the reason this is near and dear to my heart is back in the day, and by back in the day, I mean literally like two years ago. Almost everybody, well, not I don't want to be hyperbolic. A lot of folks were were making the claim that you actually would struggle to gain muscle mass if your body fat was elevated. And if you would ask them, well, okay, what do, we, what do we mean by elevated? Are we talking, you know, 30, 40, 50% body fat? They're saying, no, like if it's like 16% body fat, you know, like, so there are people who are saying, if you don't stay, you know, in that like 10 to 15% body fat range, if you go above that, you are going to hinder your ability to build muscle. So the idea was that staying perpetually lean would actually potentiate hypertrophy and facilitate better muscle building. Now, I disagreed strongly with that, um, wrote a series of articles kind of indicating, you know, why I disagreed with it mechanistically and then also why in the empirical, you know, evidence and the research, we just don't see that theory panning out. It sounds like some folks have kind of expanded that a little beyond what the evidence would, would support. And so now it sounds like people are saying, hey, if you want to get big, you need actually to not just push past 15%, not just 20, but all the way up to like 30% body fat. Uh, and that's again, something that I would disagree with. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to being at the kind of quote unquote, right body fat for bulking, um, you know, we don't need to be aiming for a very high level. Basically, we just want to make sure if we're trying to bulk and build muscle, we want to make sure we're in a physiological state that's suitable or compatible with anabolic processes. So if you are five or 6% body fat, that's going to be really tough to try to build a meaningful amount of muscle. Um, 
So you want to make sure that you are um, at least, you know, it kind of depends person to person, but you probably want to make sure that you're at least, um, you know, 10% body fat. Um, and, but, but I, I don't think that you need to try to like dreamer bulk and get your, that's kind of the, the, um, term from back in the day on the bodybuilding forums. But back in the day, everyone thought the first time you bulk, you have to literally gain as much weight as you possibly can. It doesn't matter if it's fat mass, lean mass, just lift like crazy, eat as much as you can and put on as much weight as possible. And a lot of people put on a lot more fat than they needed to. Um, so I, I would advise people not to do that. I would say you want to make sure that you have a very modest caloric surplus if you're trying to bulk up, um, you know, stay in a body fat range that works for you. And that that body fat range, you know, when I say works for you, that's really going to depend on your goals and priorities. So it's going to depend on where you're starting, you know, kind of if you're someone who's kind of been heavier your entire life, you know, that that might dictate what's a comfortable body fat range for you when it comes to bulking and cutting. Um, it's going to depend on where you want your health related biomarkers to be, um, what your fitness related goals are, all that stuff comes into play, but you definitely don't need to worry about, you know, pushing to the highest body fat that you can in order to maximize hypertrophy. I don't think we really have the evidence to support that as a, uh, as an advisable strategy for, for the vast majority of people. Mike, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. Um, I'll be asked to cut a little bit of that, but I'm fast and furious responding to some uh, comments here in the chat. Um, trying to keep uh, uh, the people here on the live show uh, uh, ready to go, getting some stuff out there. So, you know, I think, um, you know, I, it, it's something, you know, I've read a lot of your work on that. So most of what I am in, involved with in that area is from some of the articles that you referred to that you've written before, whether it's been in mass or whether it's outside of that. So I think we're on the same page there. I don't have too, too much to add for you. Um, you did a nice job on that and, and getting back to some of the folks here. Um, do you mind if I uh, uh, kind of finish up one of these uh, uh, questions here that I'm typing out and take one of these in the chat? No, go for it. Um, yeah. You want to answer it verbally instead of uh, typing? Sure. So, uh, you know, a couple of questions that got back to here real quick. I think people can see those in the chat for those that aren't that aren't listening. Um, I just got a question on in terms of, you know, from what we said about erector training, should we stay shy of failure is what Franklin said, kind of from what we're suggesting. And, you know, there really isn't, isn't evidence I have to say, oh, you should stay shy of failure or go to failure for erector training. But rather, my opinion would be probably yes, if you're doing some of these movements um, that are really stressing the lowing back just from the perspective of you don't want to lose that tightness, right? You don't want to, you know, lose the brace that you have. Similar to if you're training, you know, high rep squats all the time. Yes, there could potentially be a benefit to going to failure in some cases, and you would do that sometimes, but I wouldn't do that all the time just so I don't lose tightness on that. Somebody else asked, what about blood pressure during bracing? Certainly acute blood pressure will go up. Uh, when you're bracing. And if somebody has chronically high blood pressure or heart issues, this might be a concern. But for an otherwise healthy person, um, I wouldn't necessarily be concerned about that. And then- Yeah, the last there's point, some folks with like vascular issues who, who that your doctor might tell you like, hey, you need to make sure that you're not doing a lot of like Valsalva maneuver, heavy lifting, stuff like that. Um, because yeah, I mean, Mike, you've seen the literature- when they actually measure those acute blood pressure spikes, they are insane. They, they get to levels that I didn't think a human could get to in terms of that instantaneous acute blood pressure spike. Um, but yeah, for a healthy person who's got uh, a, a, a fit vascular system that can handle those pressures, which is most people, not a big deal. Yeah, exactly. It, it's otherwise healthy individual. I think you're, you're good to go there. Um, and then uh, the last one I was getting to is uh, Jacob asked about spinal loading and osteopenia. And, you know, I think uh, spinal loading, I don't see an inherent risk with spinal loading and spinal loading is superior to appendicular loading for bone mineral density. Um, so especially for somebody that's starting that earlier in life and actually to circle back to earlier in this episode, we talked about endurance athletes. I think that's another just longevity benefit of resistance training for endurance athletes. A lot of time endurance athletes will have lower bone density as they age than they otherwise should. And resistance training can help counteract that. So I wouldn't be worried about a safety issue um, there. I don't, he also asked, uh, and this is a good question, 
if there's a weight threshold for notable positive outcomes of spinal loading to attenuate osteopenia or for bone mineral density. And to me, uh, Trex, this is kind of a bigger concept in that I don't have a specific, hey, this load, um, you know, 50 kilograms and above that, you're not going to get any benefit. I don't, I don't have that. But I do think it's important to, to note here that in general, the health benefits typically stop way before what those that are interested in performance are going after. Meaning if a lifter is a power lifter or bodybuilder has really high bone density when they go for their yearly checkup or whenever they get a DEXA scan, that's great. However, they probably maximize the health benefits of that long before. Just as an endurance athlete who's running 140 miles a week, the elite of the elite endurance athletes, they're probably not doing a lot for their health after they're getting above a certain threshold of mileage. That's maybe a third of that. Um, so it, you could still gain bone density past a certain point, but what's the minimum threshold for benefits or the maximum threshold? I can't say, but I do think it's important that what we oftentimes as, as those mass reviewers and mass readers and all of us here in this community think is, Hey, this is what we got to do to maximize performance. This is the the baseline of, of nothing. And I'm pantomiming again for those listening. And uh, all the way up top is maximal performance. Somewhere in the middle is where you maximize the health benefits. Yeah. And I, I think it's also important to recognize like when um, I, th- I think there's a bit of a misconception with spinal loading when it comes to healthy aging and, you know, sarcopenia and osteopenia and osteoporosis, all that stuff. I think a lot of times people will say, okay, um, I heard spinal loading is good, but the problem is I don't like doing sets of three on squat. Well, there's a lot of different ways to achieve, you know, axial loading on your skeleton, right? It doesn't have to be heavy, low bar back squats or, you know, high bar back squats. Like if you're, if I were consulting with someone who's like, Hey, I'm, you know, mostly just focused on aging effectively, you know, aging in a healthy way. I want to make sure that I don't have increased fracture risk. I'm, you really don't need to think about like, okay, we're going to just crush your spine with weights that are being held on your back, right? I mean, you can, what, what you really want to focus on is making sure that the skeletal system, muscle and bone and tendon, you want to make sure that there's loading occurring in multiple directions. Um, spinal loading will naturally occur, you know, in the context of a well-structured training program. Like, you know, you're going to get some spinal spinal loading if you do perhaps uh, a jumping exercise that's appropriate for the individual based on their balance and and kind of various risk factors, right? So you could do kind of like a, some type of plyometric jumping exercise, perhaps some walking lunges. Um, There's there's a lot of different ways that you can load some of the important elements of the, the skeletal system without necessarily having to literally place a giant load directly on top of your spine. You know, you, you can certainly get the health benefits uh, of lifting, uh, particularly the skeletal benefits, using a wide range of different exercises, uh, moving in a lot of different planes of motion in different directions and different angles. Um, so I, I wanted to clear up that misconception. Uh, you, you can really, uh, really challenge the skeletal system using uh, some exercises that might surprise you. It doesn't have to be bench, squat, deadlift, row. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question. Like, just exactly like you said, right? We tend to think, oh, this is it. We tend to just kind of conflate spinal loading with squatting. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, that's it. That's what we do, especially those of us in this community. And I'm sure I'm guilty of that too, because that's the very, very first thing that comes to mind. But there's no doubt about it. Any of those variations uh, are going to do the job. There's nothing out there. um, You know, it's going to say spinal loading. It's not going to say squatting. That's just one form, one way to do it. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, there was one question that we got earlier, Mike, that, that would be interesting to address. Uh, good question here uh, from Wes. And so Wes was asking, when you're determining what volume sweet spot is ideal for an individual, so kind of how much volume per week is kind of optimal for that person, what weekly set number would you start at and how would you go about... Um, kind of titrating or advancing from that number? You know, what would that process look like? 
Yeah. So I actually really, really like this question because whenever someone asks about, hey, what's the appropriate volume to do? You know, our answer, which is a good answer and the correct answer is, well, here's the general recommendations. It's going to vary for everybody. Um, we don't know exactly. Some people may respond to 10 sets per muscle group per week, some 15, some 30. So we just don't know. You have to play around with it. And that is correct. And that's how I respond in general. But the problem with that in a, one way is you do need to be very specific sometimes because as Wes is getting at here in, in his question, he says, when determining what volume sweet spot is ideal for an individual, where would you start? People have to start somewhere. So I do think it's helpful or beneficial to give them more of a goal of a gauge to get started. And rather than giving that person a weekly set target, I would give them a per session set target. And the reason I would give them a per session set target is the one that's a, that's a smaller range. So if you're right or wrong, right, you can then adjust if you need to, but you can see how their fatigue is from that session. So again, nobody should take this to the bank. Nobody should leave here saying Zordos is bucking the trend and saying they should do ex everybody should do exactly this number of sets. Absolutely not. But on a given exercise, if somebody is, is let's not take a beginner because I'm not sure that's what Wes is getting at, but let's say somebody is a new client of yours, right? I'm going to look at what they're previously doing. I'm probably going to give them two to three sets on that exercise, that main exercise in that first session. I want to see how they handle it. Along with that, I'm going to monitor their proximity to failure on it, probably somewhere around two RIR, pretty typical, and see how they go with it. And then I'm going to gauge their session RP. I'm going to gauge their discomfort. I'm going to gauge their pleasure, displeasure on the feeling scale. And I'm going to see their perceived recovery status 48 hours later and if they're ready to train again. If they're ready to train again right away, all right, we're good to go. If we can do that three times that week, now we're about at 10 sets. And then I can progress it from there for that individual. If somebody's a complete beginner, I might do around that same number of sets, two to three in that session, but only train twice that week and keep those sets farther from failure just to make sure that they're feeling recovered. So I'd probably start somewhere around there, especially for those main exercises. And then what I would typically do is use more sets on the assistance work that isn't as fatiguing for that person. So that way, when they're coming to me as a new client, I can say, all right, a couple sets on the main lifts. And then I know we still need probably more overall volume for this person. So I might do four or five sets on a couple of assistance movements, make sure I pack that in. So it's very difficult to say. And that, that number could be completely out the window the next week because I might say, all right, we're going to need to go up. But that's a really low number of sets, obviously, to say, hey, two to three sets because you're, you're probably not going to go less than that. But the point being, it's that first week, I'm going to go conservative. This person and I got to get to know each other a little bit, see how they respond and go up from there. And there's really no downside to that. So that's probably where I would start. So again, that's not saying this is the optimal number. This is what everybody should do. This is what somebody should do. But I do think it can be helpful, even given the answer, it depends all this, which is the correct answer. It can be helpful to say, hey, here's exactly what I would do. That's a pretty low bar. That's probably not going to be too much for anybody or for most. And I would probably give that a shot. Yeah. So there's a kind of related question, not directly related, but it falls under the same general theme. So we're talking a little bit about progression, you know, within a mesocycle kind of, you know, testing the waters, titrating your training variables. So S. Kelly asked in the chat, uh, the live chat here on YouTube, from a progress overload standpoint, how many sessions is too many um, when it comes to kind of not being able to increase your load or reps? So let's say you do a training session, you know, you hit a certain load and repetition for all your exercises and the next session you're kind of stuck there and the next se session you're, you're kind of stuck there even still. So how long is too long where you start to look and say, okay, we're, we're actually like really plateaued here and we need to, uh, to start moving some things around. Cause it sounds like S Kelly here, um, you know, is very eager to make progress, but every time they kind of force themselves to kind of bump the repetitions or bump the load, they run into just kind of little aches and pains, minor injuries, things like that. Yeah. It, it's again, this is one of those things that's hard to give in exact up two sessions, two weeks, three weeks, 
But if you have a four week training block and you haven't made any progress, I would say we need to make some changes. And so the, you know, what, what, what we're saying here is, all right, so I see some injuries. So, so what are the, now we have to see, all right, what are the culprits here? Why is this not panning out? Well, it could be panning out because maybe you're already doing too much. So maybe there's too much volume already and you need to step back on that a little bit. So if you think of those general recommendations, um, you know, we're getting however many per session, 10, 15, 20 sets per week, whatever somebody's doing, and you're doing that amount and you're only through half your week and you're doing double that in a total week, then maybe you need to say, all right, I need to move back on that volume. And that's why that's occurring. If that's not why that's occurring and you're, you're pretty modest on the amount of volume you're doing, then you can look at another training variable, say proximity to failure. Maybe you're always going to failure. It's a bit too much. Maybe you're always not going to failure and you're somebody that could benefit from going a bit farther to failure. I know Trex is shocked that I just suggested you might want to go up a bit farther to failure. I know. Um, but you could change those things. But I think in general, let's say you do go a training block to give a somewhat specific answer just to be helpful, which I hope that's that's been helpful, is then to say, well, what do you need to do now? And the answer is, and I know this is generic, but the answer is you need to change something. That could be those variables we talked about. It could be your exercise selection. Um, it could be a, a drastically different going from traditional sets to incorporating more drop sets and rest pause sets. Perhaps there's um, a, a specific mechanism of hypertrophy. Perhaps you benefit from a little bit more metabolic stress, even though that's fallen out of favor. Um, so you need to change something. I had a, a, a Trex, there's a researcher, his name's uh, Carlos Yergrinovich. When I was a PhD student, he was a visiting scholar in our lab at Florida State. Uh, you've probably seen his name on a lot of papers. He's published many, many times. And uh, he said to me, Mike, uh, he said, I was, I was researching periodization and all this. He said, Mike, I'm not interested in, in all of this because he's more molecular-based guy. I got into some performance. But he said, the bottom line is, if you stall, you need to change something. He goes, it doesn't mean it has to be these traditional routes. It doesn't mean you have to decrease volume and increase volume, and increase intensity but you have to change something. And to this question, what I would say is if you go about a training block and you look at your volume and it's within range of where it should be, it's not too much, and you've progressed on it before and all of these things, then change change something that could be a bit more dramatic in that case. Maybe it's incorporating some of those other programming strategies we talked about. Maybe it's manipulating your proximity to failure. But about a training block there, if you go one week, two weeks, I wouldn't worry about that. I think that's pretty typical, especially for advanced lifters, your progress stalls, and you're going to be fighting this for years and years and years. If you take an advanced lifter and you say, hey, over the course of these next five years, you're going to add five kilos to your squat every year. That's 25 kilos in five years for somebody who is, let's say, a good level power lifter. I'd take that. You know, that's pretty good. So, um, you know, if it's, if it's just a few weeks, I wouldn't worry too much. You get past the training block, change something. Yep. Change something. Good plan. Um, I want to make sure we're, uh, paying attention to the folks in the live chat. They are the, uh, the all stars of our listenership. there. the people who join us live every Wednesday night, uh, Eastern time, 7 PM. Got a question from Mike. What would I recommend for someone prepping for a bodybuilding show to improve on posing? Uh, and the question is, you know, given that I've competed, did I seek out a posing coach? Um, I did work with a coach um, my first competition, the first time I competed. And uh, I went to, you know, a handful of posing sessions. And they were actually, this was back in the day, Mike. You remember when the internet didn't exist when I was in college? I'm very so familiar with that time. I would, I would literally, you know, nowadays everything's online, but my first bodybuilding coach was in my town at down at the gym where I was an intern, you know? And so I would drive down there and we would do group posing classes, um, which is a really efficient way to kind of get the basics down. And so I, I did a handful of those and they were super helpful. I, I do think that it's, it's very valuable to try to schedule if you can, at least just like a few posing sessions with, with a coach who can kind of say, Oh, I see, I see what what's going on here. You need to to try to focus on this. It, 
you have to kind of, it, it's like when you first started lifting and you did lat pull downs and you're like, what the heck is this supposed to work? Right. You, you had no mind muscle connection. You couldn't really feel how to engage your lats and kind of, you know, optimize that movement to make sure that you're, you're really getting a good stretch in the lats and a good contraction. Your range of motion was sloppy. Everything was out of control. It's kind of similar when you first start trying to do bodybuilding posing, right? It, it's, you, you, you don't really understand how to get into each pose correctly for most people. So a few sessions will be good to kind of learn the basics. Um, some of the stuff is very counterintuitive, like some of the back, uh, the back poses, you actually don't really want to flex your back musculature because the more that you flex, the more you tighten things up and you don't look as wide. So there's some counterintuitive pointers that are really valuable with bodybuilding posing. So I would recommend trying to schedule either in person or virtually a few posing sessions. But after that, once you have the basics uh, figured out, um, of course, you, you, just like anything else, if you decided you want to be the greatest poser of all time, uh, sure, you know, then you would continue working and working and consulting with people. But if you just want to get up on stage and do your best and, and feel like you can, you know, go and get a decent placing at a competition, probably only a few sessions is what you need. But after that, so much practice. Uh, you need to practice a ton because uh, you get up on stage. It's hotter than you expected. You're you're kind of tired. You're fatigued, um, and you really do have to hold those poses for quite some time. And especially if it's a close competition, they might leave you up on that stage for a while. And so a lot of people are very surprised in their first competition, and they say, "Wow, I was not actually in posing shape. Like I was lean and muscular, but I did not practice my posing enough to actually have the stamina." to maintain good posing throughout that entire competition. So I would say practice is really, really critical there. Um, all right, uh, Mike, I had another really good question for you, but it is slipping my mind at the moment. Was there, oh, I did want to give a shout out to Michael who, uh, says cheers from Boston. We've got folks all over the globe watching and listening right now. Boston is a lovely town. I was just there over the, uh, the holiday break and fortunately didn't have a blizzard or anything like that. Just normal weather. Loved it. Um, here's an interesting one, Mike. Uh, th- this is a, I'm curious to see what you'll say to this. So we have a question from K in the outline. Okay. And the question is considering the flexibility of rest times, volume, intensity, rep schemes, um, wouldn't it be a very simple guide to just kind of focus on the length of your total workout? Um, I think that's an intriguing question. I'll I'll kind of throw my two cents in and then see what you think, Mike. So wouldn't it be a very simple guide to to focus on just length of total workout? I would say we can probably do better than that in terms of granularity of what a training program looks like. But I will acknowledge that in the broadest sense, um, there is something to that, right? Like if you tell me, that I can only work out for 30 minutes, there, there is a, a kind of self-limiting factor in terms of how much actual training stimulus I can realistically get in those 30 minutes, right? And if you give me 90 minutes, I can probably beat myself up a lot more than I did in the 30 minutes. Uh, the reason being, you know, acute fatigue, there's, there's, no, there's no way to get around that, right? So you, you can't just take a, a legitimate high-tempo 90-minute workout and fully condense that training st- uh, stimulus into 30 minutes. If there was no wasted time and wasted effort in the 90-minute session, it just ain't going to work, you know? So um, I would say conceptually, there is something to that. Um, I would also say in a more practical perspective, it's not that I tell people, hey, um, instead of worrying about all this other crap like rest periods and sets and all, you know, total volume and all this stuff, It's not like I'm saying, hey, just go train for an hour and then we don't have to worry about that stuff. But I actually see this having more merit in the reverse direction. And what I mean by that is a lot of times people will will kind of ask these questions um, where they say, well, what is the optimal training frequency and the optimal set volume? Combine that with the optimal rest period. People start asking me all these questions. And then you'll sit down and, and you'll you'll work your way through all that stuff and then say, okay, so here's your program. And they say, oh, the problem is I can only train three days a week for like 45 minutes each. So it's like, well, then what, what were you doing all this stuff for, <laughs> right? Because you don't have enough time to actually optimize all these variables that we just spent 
a lot of time talking through. So in a way, like sometimes people will ask about, you know, how do I optimize these three different things all at the same time? Sometimes I'll say, wait a minute, let's start at the beginning, which is how many days a week can you realistically train on a consistent basis? And what kind of a time block can we actually kind of allocate to training? When I work with a client, I don't start with these like hyper optimized, you know, we need to get in there every 72 hours for this muscle group and it's got to be three minute rests. And we don't start with all that. I sit down and I say, be realistic. How much are we training on a weekly basis? And usually you're going to get your training frequency and how many total hours are being spent in the gym. That is going to dictate in many cases the kind of upper limit, the upper threshold for how much volume you can do, assuming that you're following uh, best practices with regards to rest times for rest periods. Um, So I I think that this is a really valid observation, but particularly when you run it in reverse. So I, I would not say, hey, just train for 60 minutes and don't worry about all this crap. But what I would say is, oh, we only have 60 minutes to train. Not that that's a short time, but we have 60 minutes to train now, how do we make the most of that based on what we know in the literature about rest periods, volume, you know, set volume, total volume, all this other stuff? I, I could not agree more. While you were talking the, the earlier, the first thing I wrote down and then you got to it was figure out how long you can commit to training and then work backwards from that. Mm-hmm. And so, and that's essentially, uh, in my opinion, what you just discussed, what you just covered. So if you have only 30 minutes to train, Great. You can work with that, but you need to know that up front and then your training can be planned around that. That's when you're utilizing a lot of those rest, pause and drop sets and so forth. If you have 30 minutes to train and you are interested in strength, let's say you might work up to one top heavy set first because strength is really dependent upon that peak load and then do everything to get into that. So I, I, the the concept of saying, hey, can we just, uh, I, I, you're not first saying I have this long to train you're saying, all right, I'm just going to worry about total time in the gym. And part of that question said, well, if you get more out of, you know, longer sets, they're more productive. Um, well, they, that's true that they, they, they could be. Um, but if you equate for volume with shorter sets, uh, hypertrophy tends to be similar. And so, yes. And I think I talked about this on a recent episode of, of, um, office hours is that yes, longer rest intervals in between sets do tend to be better for muscle growth when sets are equated compared to doing shorter rest. But if you add sets with the shorter rest to equate for volume, then hypertrophy tends to be similar. So I think that's an important distinction. And so, yeah, I I would figure out the time, just as Dr. Trexler said you have, and then work backwards from that. Because I also think it's important that, let's say you have, you say, all right, I'm going to just measure my total time in the gym. Um, well, you have to stay on track to get there, especially if it's a 30, 45, 60 minute session. So having something in between to stay on track to get there is good. And I think it helps inherently to keep somebody focused. Um, Trex, you and I have talked about this before going back, I think a couple of years now in that I've mentioned to you previously that, that I always enjoyed rest, pause and drop set training and superset training just from the practical perspective of after I did my main lifts and took longer rest, sure, I wanted to eventually get out of the gym so I wasn't there three hours, but it kept me focused. And I felt I actually almost indirectly got more out of those sets because I was keyed in and zeroed in on those sets. So I would look at um, how long you have to train them backwards and program everything in that way. Also, uh, I see here uh, real quick, Kim, been to Boston, haven't spent a lot of time there. I did just visit New Jersey, though. Had some cold the first time my son ever got to see snow, though. He's eight years old. We live in Florida. Tina, I went to Santa Cruz once. It was awesome. Uh, They even had an old school video store that my wife and I walked around forever, and we loved it. This day, she says, I want to open up a video store. I said, nobody's going to give us a loan for that. And, uh, uh, West, by the way, they're doing you a favor by not giving you that loan. That's what I said. I said, that's good information. Yeah. I said, I said, that's good information, right? It's like when the insurance is really high to build your house in the middle of the ocean. I said, this is good information. And, um, uh, for uh, Wes, I am from Maryland. So Hagerstown, I'm from, uh, uh, Potomac Rockville area, uh, and so forth. So 
What if you are not limited for time? Uh, Tina asks here as we continue on that one. Yeah, if you're not limited for time, then I would probably take longer rest. Um, you know, I think the best thing that you 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 can manipulate is your performance. And if you can manipulate your performance to be better, which it should be better with longer rest, then I would take the longer rest. Absolutely. Now, I do think there's a certain point where you're just in the gym so long where you might start to drag a little bit. So I would I would think about kind of the um the kind of the psychology that goes along with that after a really long time if you can keep your focus. But no doubt, just just to give like a blanket answer to that, if you're not limited for time, um, I would complete the volume, especially on the main lifts with with longer rest. Yes. Yeah. Um Mike, we've got a really interesting question here that uh this is another one where I'm curious. There's a possibility that we could disagree on this. I don't know. So it'll be right. interesting to find out. So we've got one here. Um, the question is, I'm wondering if more volume is a good trade-off from a hypertrophy standpoint if it means getting less sleep. So if the only way I can get more volume into my program is by adding another training session uh, so having another day of the week where I have to wake up extra early to go to the gym, um, is that a good trade-off? So the context here would be going from four to five weekly training sessions, but getting six hours instead of seven and a half on that new workout day. So generally they sleep seven and a half hours on days they're not training and six hours on days that they are training. Um, they're trying to figure out, is this, uh, is this trade-off worth it? So I would, um, I would say just answering the question directly and ignoring all the context. Not everyone benefits from adding more volume to their program. You know, it kind of depends on where you're at and what your kind of optimal volume is in, in terms of hypertrophy training. We can't just keep adding more and more and more and more and expect linear progress. So I think it is somewhat impossible to answer this in a way that would be correct for everybody. But I would say that most people, well, my suspicion is that most people will at least have some modest increase in hypertrophy by adding a whole training day to their week. Um, some people, maybe not, but my, my inclination is to say it probably will be worth it uh, in the short term in terms of hypertrophy um, because we know sleep is good for hypertrophy, but um, I, I, I really worry that like when we talk about things that are important for hypertrophy, right? We'll say like, oh, protein's important for hypertrophy. Um, sleep is important for it. Yeah, that that's all good. But these are things that play like a permissive role on allowing hypertrophy to happen once there's an adequate stimulus for it, right? So we talk about protein and hypertrophy. You're not going to eat your way to growth if you're not lifting, you know, meaningful muscle growth. Um, same thing with sleep. You're not going to sleep your way to a bunch of muscle growth without the actual training stimulus. And, you know, volume seems to be a pretty important driver of hypertrophy, not, not the only driver, but, um, but yeah, I would say in most cases in the short term, getting in that extra training session for a lot of folks will be worth it because sleep is good for hypertrophy, but the magnitude of effect is nowhere near what we're talking about with like actually doing resistance training, right? Um, but, but with this question, it's all about magnitudes, right? To what, to what severity are you undersleeping? How far from your optimal training vo volume are you currently? And will that extra session really move you meaningfully toward a more optimal volume for you? There's so many individualized factors here that it's hard to give a generalized answer. Um, but I would say, you know, like in many cases, the trade-off will be worth it. Um, but the problem is, uh, sleep is, sleep matters for a lot more than just growing muscle, right? So in the short term, it might be great in the long term, then we have to worry about the real world stuff, right? So are you going to feel like crap from not sleeping enough? And then eventually just say, man, I'm just completely worn down and beat. And I'm just going to take a week off so I can catch up on sleep. What's the cost of that, right? I mean, in general, not much, but if we're adding, you know, four training days a week or four training days a month, and then we're taking an extra week off, you know, between four week cycles, we're, we're just kind of adding training days just to take them away later. So all of that is to say, it's really complicated, but I'm going to try to be, um, 
I'm going to try to just pretend that everything in life is easy and that this isn't a complicated thing and say, if you can't, what I would encourage you to do probably is rather than having this back and forth, I sleep more on these days, I sleep less on those days. I would encourage you to spread your training out a little bit more evenly, more sessions that are shorter so that you can have the same amount of sleep every night approximately because everything we know about sleep hygiene would suggest that it's going to be very advantageous if you can try to maintain the same sleep time, the same the same wake time. And so if that means that you have to uh, you know, spread your training out throughout the week a little bit differently, even if you're maybe, you know, I, I think you can probably end up in a spot where you keep the same total training volume, but allocate it differently throughout the week, have more frequent, but shorter sessions, get a similar amount of sleep every night. I think that's probably the the direction that I would go personally. What do you think, Mike? Well, I love this question because I'm not sure there is a an exact clear answer the 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 first thing that comes to mind is that i don't think it has to be a binary choice meaning that i don't think you have to do this every week it could be something where as you want to get in that extra volume you you do it a week you you sacrifice an hour or so of sleep as i said i think down from seven and a half to six hours and then the next week uh you sleep in that day you you get that seven and a half to eight hours of sleep uh, and then you do it again the next week. It could be something you do certain times of the year. Um, but there's also just to, I, I generally agree, but just to kind of take a little bit on the other side, it, it, it could depend on the person. Some people don't need as much sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm one of those folks. I don't sleep. I sleep, but I sleep six-ish, five to six hours a night every night. Um, and I feel pretty good. I train really, really early in the morning. And one of the reasons I I, I only sleep that much is so I have time to train. Um, and I do that early in the morning. And so I'm a little bit biased in that direction, but other folks do need that eight hours. Um, and those individuals are going to need to get that in. Uh, the other component of this, although it sounds like he's a habitual or, or she's, I can't remember who, who wrote the question. Um, uh, uh, George is here. I, it sounds like this person is a habitual early morning uh, somebody just trains in the morning. Yeah. And so the one thing to keep in mind for a lot of people is if you are not somebody who habitually trains early in the morning and you were to do this, you would probably have a strength deficit when you went into the gym, if you sacrifice that sleep, especially, and then went in the gym right after waking up. If this person is habitually training in the morning, they've probably adjusted to it. They've adapted to it. So they should be okay. So it's, it's hard. It's tough. There's so many layers to this, right? Because the, the 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 first one also is, well, what magnitude more of hypertrophy or of volume is going to contribute to hypertrophy? There's no guarantee that that additional volume is going to contribute um, to hypertrophy in a meaningful way. It might, but I think we we think see that all the time in research studies. There was a little bit more volume here than here, but there wasn't a difference in muscle growth. And somebody will say, well, see, um, more volume isn't isn't better in that case. Well more volume may have been better. The difference just might not have been enough. Um, and so will that contribute to our Maybe, maybe not. Let's say for the sake of argument, it does. Okay. Then if you want to do it, I would probably not make a binary choice. I would probably say, all right, let's do it for a week or two. Then the next week you back off, you take that sleep and so forth. Another option is to go about it how Trek suggested um, and to spread that volume out a bit more evenly across the week. But maybe that person can only train on these five days and that's it. Um, can't train on the other days, has certain time constraints. So taking the question at face value, I just probably wouldn't look at it as a binary choice. Um, but knowing that I'm a bit biased toward doing the training um, and uh, uh, sleep patterns for, for everybody could be a bit different. But I think that is a, a great question. Yeah, definitely. And it, it's one of the other things I like about the question is that it's it's a very practical question, right? Like that that is a real question that people wrestle with really frequently, which is, you know, for like for me, for instance, I am not sleeping enough right now. Uh, maybe you could tell by the way that when I started the episode, I was just staring at my computer screen disoriented. Um, I'm not sleeping enough. Uh, it's a short term thing. It's a busy week, uh, but I'm getting the training in because I, I think it's worth it to make sure that I'm getting that training in. Uh, I know, and it's not even from a, 
you know, if I miss a workout, my muscle is going to shrivel up. It's not that. It's that I know how I respond to um, kind of habits, right? Keeping that habit every day. Because I will say this, um, when I'm in that groove and I'm training every day, it's just part of the day. It's habitual. You don't think about it. It's all good. But uh, when COVID happened and, and the lockdowns happened and gyms were closed and all that stuff, that was the first time since I was like 12 years old that I wasn't itching to get in the gym and able to get in the gym, you know, five, six days a week. And uh, something that I never expected was I, I kind of realized early in COVID, I was like, you know, I'm not going to the gym all the time. And wow, I, I kind of love having this extra time in the day. Um, now that gets old pretty quick. And then you remember why you were into lifting and exercising in the first place, right? It will get old eventually. But I remember for the first little bit saying like, wow, I've never really tested these waters of not training. And uh, this is kind of cool to have some extra free time and I'm not, you know, sore and all this other stuff. But uh, but yeah, then, then, then I came crawling back, obviously. But um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, right now I'm, I'm in that same situation where every day I'm thinking, man, do I set the alarm later? and skip the workout or do I wake up and get the training in? And, uh, unfortunately four o'clock rolls around and that alarm keeps going off, but you know, you get in the gym, you get it done and, and you live to, to fight another day. Um, okay. So we've got uh, a question here from Jorel, broken metatarsal from hiking, not from lifting. And their question is, uh, you know, they just healed up and they're, they're a little bit leery about squatting and deadlifting. What kind of stress do those exercises actually put on our feet? Uh, the load is not massive. It was 1.5 times body weight before the injury. So I don't, I mean, w- with any question like this, that's kind of clinical in nature. I think that your best bet is to talk with the folks who have been uh, treating you, treating you for that, that injury, getting their assessment of where your specific, you know, what you are ready for. You know, they know how your bone is healed up. They know the, the nature and severity of the injury. That's going to be the best place to get um, kind of individualized guidance on something like that. But I, I do think it's it's worthwhile to kind of mention this this question just in a more general sense, because looking back at it, I, I felt like really silly the first time I kind of made this connection. And I think maybe other people might have a little light bulb go off when they think about this. But I remember when I was younger and I was like, I, I was convinced, you know, because I started lifting when I was 12 and I loved lifting. But I was also kind of worried, like, maybe I'm going to stunt my growth, you know, because that was what everybody said. Like, when you're lifting, you're putting all these, all this pressure on your growth plates of your long bones, and, and you're going to stunt your growth. Um, and they're like, think of the forces that are occurring when you're doing those leg extensions, you know. <laughs> and then I, then I, for the first time in a biomechanics class, uh, became privy to the amount of forces on your bones um, when you, like, jump off of a, a normal-sized chair or bench. And just the insane amounts of force that are going through all these different uh, bones and joints. And what you realize is that like, when it comes to, you know, your feet, your knees, things like that, and you're worried about what are the things that's really putting substantial amounts of force on these different tissues, it's usually like athletic movements more so than, you know, doing some stuff in, in the, in the gym resistance training, right? It's the really high velocity, you know, weight bearing movements where you are, you know, turning and cutting and jumping and landing. So, um, all of that is to say, sometimes we, we think of, you know, something like a squat as like the most force that we could be putting on these tissues because it's, you know, the heaviest bar that we load and and we kind of make that connection of, wow, we're really doing some, some very high force things here. Um, but, but I would say, um, it's worthwhile to, to reconsider like, well, if I'm worried about forces on my feet, like running beats the crap out of my feet a lot more than lifting. I mean, Mike, I assume that you would agree with that. Trex, I am sitting here right now with uh, a product called Second Skin and tape over nearly every single toe on my foot. Probably shouldn't have run 16 miles today, but did. And uh, hopefully uh, my blisters don't destroy me tomorrow. Yeah, but but even just like the forces, like, when I would get into running, um, I had this habit where I would get into running and then immediately injure myself. Um, and I did it again and again and again, because I'm just, I'm a really 
extreme person, you know? So when I start running, I don't ease into it. I'm within a few weeks, I'm doing 12 mile, pretty hard runs and then I'm hurt. And it's always a foot injury. It, you know, it, it's never, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm sure folks are very, um, astutely observing, well, with, with running, it's not just force. It's also volume, right? It's pounding and pounding and pounding for long periods. And that's definitely true. But all of this is to say, you know, we, we always think about the force on, on our, you know, knees and bones and joints and all that stuff from something like a squat or a leg press, but man, don't, don't sleep on jumping. Like jumping is crazy for, for forces. So, um, you know, you, you might find that squatting and deadlifting are, are more tolerable than you thought, uh, for your foot. But like I said, for individualized advice, I would just speak to a clinician who is familiar with your specific injury. They can probably lead you in the right direction. I assume that they will probably, this is a guess, probably encourage you to, if, you know, if you're nervous about it, just work your way up to it, right? And do some, some other stuff in the gym, kind of test the waters and then uh, work your way toward it once you feel a little more comfortable, I guess. You know, something just came to mind when I was a a strength coach at a university, um, some years ago now, uh, in off season workouts, sometimes uh, football players would come in and have the workout ready to go. It's all right, let's go. And, uh, can't, can't train today. I hurt my ankle. What are we doing? Every single time playing basketball. Stop. Yep. Right. Every time I came down on it, you know, and, and, uh, so those foot injuries, like you said, you said, don't sleep on jumping, uh, every time. So we would joke, me and the other coaches say, we got, we got to ban basketball yeah. in the off season for these guys. Cause it is, they're always getting hurt, uh, playing that. So I think that's well said. Yeah. And a lot of athletes, they'll have like, um, I've, I've heard with a lot of NFL players, they'll have contract stipulations where it says, if you get hurt playing basketball, or if you get hurt riding your motorcycle, like skiing, they're, they're, snowboarding. Yeah. Something. Th- there's like a few of these high risk activities that other sports will say, listen, if, if you get hurt, you know, if you get in a car accident, you, this, that, the other thing, if you get hurt playing the sport you're paid to play, we got you. But if you're doing that crap and you get hurt, like, all this crap is void, you know, like, like there's serious penalties. There's, there's an old, I don't know if you're a baseball fan, trucks or any baseball fans out there. I grew up a baseball fan. All right. Back in, well, you know, my, my, most of my sports knowledge, uh, except for a few things these days is back from when I was growing up. And so back in the early 2000s, a really good second baseman for the San Francisco Giants. His name was Jeff Kent. And, uh, Jeff Kent, I think the story goes, he had one of those stipulations in his contract and allegedly, he uh, was injured riding his motorcycle. Um, he said he injured himself washing his truck. And I remember this story being all over the news, all over Sports Center for a while. Uh, second baseman Jeff Kent, MVP candidate, was hurt washing his truck. And every article was talking about how it was really from his motorcycle. What was true about that, I cannot say, or what was in his contract, but um, just reminded me about. Yeah, there's always like, I, I, I feel like I've heard at least half a dozen stories like that of athletes who it says like, you know, you can't do this super dangerous thing. And they're like, what? I didn't fall off my motorcycle. And they're like, then why is the, your, your entire face like completely scabbed over? <laughs> like, why do you have road rash over two thirds of your body? It's like, ah, washing my truck. That's right. It, yeah, it happens. It's, it's a dangerous list. And I have a truck, so I'm going to, I'm going to watch out, uh, when I go to clean it next time. Yeah. You, you can never be too careful. Um, all right, Mike, uh, I think that might be about time to wrap up the show, uh, unless there's Another question you want to get to? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a lightning round real quick that's going to last about a minute. Uh, uh, Jason, I'm not familiar with that place, but when I was in Rockville, I used to go to a place called Chinese House of Chicken right off of Rockville Pike. Uh, next time I'm in town, I will check that out. Um, I see uh, in terms of Josh saying, is that contextual interference? I don't know exactly what you're referring to. I think this was back when we were talking about the sleep question. Um, and we were altering maybe between sleep and no sleep. It could have been something else in there, but just to give a definition of that for anybody that was asking about this is, uh, Ben remembers Jeff Kent. Fantastic. I also think he should have been MVP one of those years too. I thought he got robbed of it. Um, and, uh, thanks Steven. And, uh, so in terms of contextual interference, again, I think that was getting back to when we talked about the sleep question, but just in general, what that is, is if you are doing something, you're practicing a skill of some kind. And then in between the rest periods of that skill, you perform another skill to take your attention away from it. 
So you can't memorize it, right? You have to relearn it each time. That's contextual interference. An example in the lifting literature, we did a study years ago looking at bench pressing and novices in which we taught the bench press technique and showed a video. In the rest interval, we didn't want them to just memorize it. So we had them throw darts and we graded them on their dart performance. We had them throw darts with their non-dominant arm and then they really had to focus on it. Then they went back to the bench press. They had to relearn it each time. That's called the reconstruction hypothesis. That's contextual interference. You might hear that referred to as uh, blocked practice or random pl- practice. Another study in baseball players, you could throw on all fastballs or you're throwing random fastball, curveball, changeup, something like that, um, and and so forth. So uh, there's a lot uh, uh, that's that's in there on those rapid fire questions. But uh, otherwise, to everybody else that commented there, uh, uh, thanks for commenting in the chat. Appreciate it. But I wanted to get to that one there specifically. Yeah, just want to echo uh, the gratitude. Thanks for everyone who joined us live here. Um, and you know what? This is our 18th episode. We've done 17 without any audio issues. Everything's gone smoothly. And for some reason, we're having audio problems. So I appreciate everyone for sticking with us as we kind of work through those on the fly. Um, I will have uh, my work cut out for me editing over the next two days, but hopefully we can turn this into something beautiful uh, that our listeners uh, deserve. So thanks everyone for joining us live here. Um, I'll be back in a week and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be with Dr. Helms uh, one week from today. That'll be next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern time. So what that means is uh, get those questions in for me and Dr. Helms. If you've got questions about, oh, I don't know, uh, bodybuilding, nutrition, psychology, behavior change, all those stuff that Helms and I like to talk about, all those topics we like to talk about, get those questions in. And you know what? Whatever question you want, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we get the right person to answer it over the next few weeks. So uh, once again, thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you have a fantastic week and I will be back in exactly seven days. Music